Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Yair Rosenberg is a writer at The Atlantic, where he writes the Deep Shtetl newsletter and covers the intersection of politics, culture, and religion. Previously a senior writer at Tablet Magazine, he has also written for The New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and The Guardian. And his work has received awards from the Religion News Writers Association and the Harvard Center for Jewish Studies. He's covered everything from national elections in America and Israel, to observant Jews in baseball, to the translation of Harry Potter into Yiddish, to Muslims and Jews in comic books, and in his spare time, he creates bots that troll anti-Semites on Twitter and composes and sings original Jewish music, which is what I, lucky me, get to focus on today. Yair's new album called Az Yashir, or Now We Sing, which was recently released and can be found on his website and on Spotify, and where else? Everywhere? Everywhere. Anywhere Everywhere the music, music is sold. Yeah. Yair, yeah, welcome. Thank and congratulations you. on the album. A lot of people are like, what? <laughs> Who knew? Um, Who knew you sang? Who knew you composed? This is like the secret, secret Yair talents coming. First you established your journalistic bona fides, and now you're it, really- It was all a ruse it was to all get people ruse. to pay attention to me so that then right, I now you have your push platform. my music on them. <laughs> but let's just, for those who don't know you, just let's, can we have a little bit of your Jewish story kind of on one foot of how you got here? So um, pretty uh, boring in that uh, uh, another New York Jewish kid uh, who goes to New York Jewish day schools. Well, um, you have an interesting ancestry. Uh, yeah, so, you know, m both my parents are Jewish educators, my grandparents, um, several of them were Holocaust survivors, um, and that does play a role in the album, which we can discuss, uh, because my grandfather on my father's side was a Hasidic composer uh, who escaped uh, the Holocaust and uh, along the way composed uh, one of his most uh, influential compositions that people still sing to this day. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, and so, you know, so you have this long line of both music and Judaism, um, and for a long time I compose things in my head, but because I don't play any instruments and I don't read any music, uh, I didn't know what I would do with them or even how to share them with people. And it took quite a long time to figure out how to do it. Uh, so that's the real reason. So before we get to how you did it, yeah. you're talking about sort of a Jewish childhood that was kind of unquestioned, you never wavered. I mean, there's, there's people who have had you know, even, you know, I've interviewed people who suddenly felt like they had to eat a cheeseburger. In their yeah, life. or the reverse, or some people who found Judaism later. So in that way, as I say, it's, it's, it's a somewhat boring story. Now, I, it doesn't mean that I spent my entire lifetime in cloistered Jewish environments. Obviously, I professionally, uh, you know, work in, uh, for the Atlantic, where I write about Jews, but for a non-Jewish audience. Um, and, and how then, do you think about that? Do you, you make sure that you're not speaking in sort of a secret vernacular or kind of assuming too much knowledge? So I think, first of all, that people uh, understand more than we give them credit for. I think a lot of journalism sometimes uh, falls into a trap of sort of condescending to readers and uh, thinking that they uh, can't figure certain things out. But at the same time, you want to make sure uh, what you do is accessible. Um, and so I've had a long time to figure out exactly where that is. And the way I describe it is I'm not writing for the Jews, I'm writing from the Jews. And the idea is you have this group of people been around for thousands of years. And uh, they, you know you, you can't help but learn a few things along the way. And your texts and your traditions and your experience aren't just for you, but there's something that can teach other people how to address contemporary concerns. Uh, so that is what I try to do very often in my writing. And when you were at Harvard, you were at the Crimson. Was was Jewish life a focus? Judaism a focus? Religion at that time? So, you know, like many Jews, I spent a wonderful time at Harvard Hello, but I was the movies editor of the Harvard Crimson because that is the best job on the paper. You get to just uh, go see movies for free with the real critics, like the Boston Globe people and all of those folks, uh, and pretend to be a movie critic when you're not really. Uh, you're just a kid in your dorm room, but people take you very seriously. Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that's what I did. And then towards the end of my time um, on The Crimson, I started doing a little bit more stuff with their editorial board where I felt I had a little more confidence uh, in my opinions. Because even back then, I was aware that, uh, uh, I think people are more aware of this today, but when you write something, you know, uh, online, it's there forever. And you want to make sure that it's something that you're not too unhappy that it's still there. And I've seen lots and lots of students write that one piece for their college paper that later on they, they regret. absolutely regretted. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, I'm not going to regret my Toy Story 3 review, but I'll probably regret a whole lot of my thoughts as a, you know, young developing college person. So That was prescient. Let me, let me take some time on this. Of course, it turns out today, um, uh, you might actually regret, uh, you know, a movie review too. You never know. Um, but uh, it was a really wonderful experience. I really loved working at the Crimson. The, my colleagues were really great. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Shabbat observant Jew. And so sometimes that would come, uh, you know, into contact with when we would have a meeting or when certain things would be due. And they just let me, you know, they accommodated my schedule and uh, enabled me to do that job and really enjoy it. 
So you never wrote about particularly Jewish topics while, while there? That all came later? I don't think so, not really. I mean, maybe there's one piece or another that touched on these topics. But uh, no, I was writing about films, or maybe I was covering some sort of event uh, that might have had some Jewish element. Um, I well, recall reviewing a couple age. books that had Jewish themes uh, because in order to become an editor at the Crimson, you have to do a certain amount of writing and for certain different types of sections. So when I did the books, I inevitably uh, reviewed something Jewish. I got a copy, people may know the book, As a Driven Leaf by Milton Steinberg, uh, Reconstructionist classic. Rabbi, a classic. He had an unfinished novel that came out while I was in college. It was called The Prophet's Wife. He'd passed away, but people unearthed this manuscript and they uh, decided to publish it in its unfinished form. Um, and I got them to send me a copy so I could review it in the Harvard Crimson which was super fun and just an excuse for them to, to get someone to send me a copy of this book. Um, and so on occasion that, that did poke its way through as well. Okay. Um, but it wasn't, I, I didn't go around like a reviewing Jewish movies, although now today if you watch, I, you know, you look at my writing, sometimes I will write about television and films, Jewish and not, um, and now you know where that comes from. So let's talk about your grandfather for a minute and sure. this song that, that outlived him, Song of the Redemption, am I right? Yes. Tell us, if you can, just the story of that song and why it took on such importance. Yeah, so my grandfather um, was said to be able to remember any melody after he heard it just once. Uh, he was an incredibly musical person. Um, what was his name? His name was Rabbi Israel David Rosenberg, although at the time he's just Israel David. Um, and he, um, along with many other yeshiva students, had to flee the advance of the Nazis. Um, and they found their way to this Japanese diplomat named Sugihara, um, who some viewers may know, um, went against his government's orders and gave thousands of visas uh, to Jews, um, including these yeshiva students, in order to escape uh, the Holocaust. And uh, because of that, many of them ended up in Shanghai during the war, including my grandfather. Um, and so while they're there, they're in this time of incredible uh, fear and uncertainty because they don't speak the language, they don't know this country, they never expected to be here, and basically the only thing they do know is that their families have been murdered. Um, and so they're all just there not knowing what's going to become of them. Uh, and they get this letter that comes from the United States that's attributed to the Lubavitcher Rebbe at the time. Um, that is a letter of encouragement uh, that's saying, although there's been this tremendous devastation, um, there will be redemption at the end and you will uh, have a future. Um, and they found this incredibly meaningful. And back then, if you wanted to remember a document, uh, you couldn't WhatsApp it to each other. They didn't have phones. Uh, so they said to my grandfather, can you put it to music? And that way we'll remember it. Um, and so he did. And that became the Shir Hagelula, or the Song of Redemption, a Jewish redemption song. Um, and people who came then to America and other places, they took it with them. And they taught it to more generations of people. So now you can go and look online, and you will find different renditions of this song being sung to this day. Um, although one day, I'd like to do my own version, which hasn't been done yet. You know, we know, we know, we have the family tradition of how exactly my grandfather sang it. We have his recording, where we even know what sort of instruments sometimes he wow. wanted to play during parts And it of has it. kind of the beat of a march, am I right? So Despite devastating lyrics. It does two different things, right? It starts out as a sad song, and it becomes an upbeat song. Um, so it starts out talking about the devastation, and then it turns into sort of a charge and saying, you know, that it's up to us uh, to carry on, um, even in the face of what has happened before. And you grew up singing it. Um, so we grew up learning it and singing it. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, so my father is also uh, quite musical. He's a synagogue rabbi and an educator at SAR Academy in Riverdale, um, but also, you know, leads uh, services at uh, What's his name? Can you Rabbi Moshe Rosenberg, and people may know that name because he is, uh, among other many other things, the author of the unofficial Hogwarts Haggadah. Um, the Hogwarts Haggadah. Yes, okay. which, uh, or, you know, which is, uh, you know, you'd be amazed. We go all over the place. He wrote it as this little passion project because he was originally an English teacher uh, before he was a Judaic studies educator, a high school English teacher. And he's always had a great um, affinity uh, for all kinds of literature, uh, of all, you know, like things that people disdain as lowbrow and things that people consider highbrow. All of these things to him are ways of, uh, in, you know, appreciating, um, you know, God's world, right, and the human world. And so he likes to put those things in dialogue. And so he loved Harry Potter, realized his students loved Harry Potter, and while teaching at Academy, had a club where the kids would discuss Harry Potter and Jewish themes. Um, and out of that, he eventually said, okay, I'm going to write uh, a Haggadah, which will use the sorts of insights and things that we've talked about in this club, right, in a nicely designed uh, thing that you can use and in your say there. And so he thought, like, okay, well, you know, we, we humored him, you know, as, a, as we helped to, you know, put it together. We self published it on Amazon and thought, you know, hopefully this makes back the money and the time that we spent on it. Um, and, you know, it's still tens of thousands of copies. It's amazing. Um, which and your is mom, I don't thing. want to leave your mom out. My mother is a special education teacher at SAR as well. And actually, has been her there since. Her name? Um, so her name is Dina Rosenberg. And, uh, you know, these names are all in my head because they're obvious, but uh, to the average person, no. But uh, my mother has taught generations upon generations of students mm. um, at SAR. Um, and uh, also, um, her family on her side, so it's not 
per se like a musical compositional family, um, but she grew up uh, every single Shabbat seeing her father, uh, who escaped the Holocaust uh, from Germany, um, would in front of them would lay the entire parsha um, as a way of learning, you know, the weekly portion, wow. um, and like that makes an impression on you as a kid. It meant that they, you know, both the, uh, his son but also his daughters knew this stuff in their head. They were familiar with it in a way that many people were not. Um, and so the music runs, in, certainly Jewish music runs in both sides of this family. And were you known, I mean, let's put humility aside for a minute. Were no. you known as a good singer? Were you like auditioning for shows and getting parts? Were you like, let's have Yair sing, he's the best? Um, I lead services in the synagogue, right? And you know that you can sing, right? You get feedback and you learn that you're pretty good at this sort of thing. Um, but I never did anything professionally. I, obviously, I have a career. Um, and uh, I just did this because it was something I enjoyed and something I was good at and something that people found, like when you're leading services and you can do it well, and that's not necessarily about how good your voice is. It's very often about the right, choosing the right tunes, fitting them in the proper way and conveying the proper um, emotion and tempo and meter so that other people can sing along. Uh, we can get that with the album. This album is very much in that spirit. It's not, let's show off my voice. It's right? get other people to sing it's, with let's me. Let's get this song stuck in your head and make it easy for you to figure out how you would sing it yourself. That's correct. Um, and because that's what Shabbat singing is all about. And as you know, this album is a Shabbat album. All the songs So first, let's, songs. Let's, let's, let's talk about the album now, yeah. the concept for it. Um, was this originally the idea, was to make it Shabbat focused? Uh, yeah, um, always was in my head the idea that uh, if you're going to make a music album uh, for people uh, to sing, it should be songs that they're most likely to be somewhat familiar with. Um, and uh, in the Jewish community, that's going to be traditional Shabbat songs. And this album ranges for stuff that people have definitely heard some of, like Shalom Aleichem and maybe L'Chad well, Adi, right? To stuff that's a little bit more uh, less known. Um, but the idea was, let's start with things that people already have some knowledge of and affinity for. Uh, and then give them some more modern and contemporary melodies to go with it. Um, but and, you get them in the door with the familiar. Yeah, and like the because the goal was to to give something to the Jewish community to enliven people's Jewish lives. Um, and uh, you, if you can, if you do it with like exotic, amazing lyrics uh, that uh, no one's ever heard, uh, and you do it in like a really high key that you can hit, say, as a tenor, then it's inaccessible um, and it's, it's foreign. Something it's it's inaccessible and it's foreign. It doesn't mean it can't be awesome. Right? Someone like me might very much enjoy that, and there are many people in a particular space who will like that, uh, but it, it wouldn't have the ability to reach a lot of people. Or maybe gain traction. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have illusions about this sort of thing getting traction. I'd like it to gain traction. Uh, but I, I did want that if you did come across this, uh, it would feel like something that you could pick up and you could add into your uh, Shabbat table, right? You could add it into your synagogue service with relative ease. So let's just uh, pause for a minute and listen to one of them. Let's start with Shalom Aleichem. Do you want to say anything about it before we hear it? Um, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, I'm told that uh, small children really like this song um, and that uh, they, they really enjoy listening to it. I, I warn you, if your small child gets obsessed with this song, you may have to hear it many more times than you like, so um, be warned in advance. Great. Let's listen. Shalom Aleichem Wonderful. You're, you're playing with genres here. It yes. sounds like you're playing with quite a few of them. Can you list some of the ones that uh, you particularly love in terms of just, I would even say, is it Lo Tevoshi? Tevoshi? That it sounds like a country music song a little bit. Yeah. 
something else is a little bit more digital, right? Or a little more, yeah. tell us some of the genres that, that, that are in this album. Yeah, so um, I don't set out to compose a song that sounds like a particular genre, um, but what you learn when you start composing music is that it ends up sounding like the music you like and listen to a lot. Um, and so I would compose a lechad odi, and then someone would listen to it and say, oh, you did an Irish folk lechad odi. And I was like, I didn't do that, I didn't do that on purpose, not for sure. Uh, but when I listened to it again, I'm like, oh yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's because I love Irish folk music. Um, there's a heavy influence of uh, folk music in general on this album, because folk music, again, is designed to be sung communally and easy to pick up and sing. Um, and it often is like standard lyrics that a lot of people already know. Um, and so, there's this group called the High Kings, um, which is this wonderful Irish quartet. The um, High Kings. The High Kings. Um, and I highly recommend it to folks who've never listened to Irish folk music at all. What they do is sort of what I try to do with Shabbat songs here, which is they take old Irish standards and ballads, and then they give them a more modern expression, uh, while remaining true to the source material. Um, and so I, of course, am trying to do that with some of these Shabbat songs. What about just the sacrilege of taking text that is familiar, and melodies that are familiar, and kind of upsetting the apple cart a little bit in terms of what people know and treasure. Did you worry about that? I don't really. Um, I think that there was more concern about this. Like I think there always has been concern over this in the Jewish music world. Um, but like, when I was growing up, you had people who were like Jewish music boy bands, right? And they were controversial for a moment, but then they were extremely successful and that didn't like, like so all those controversies have been had for me. And now it's more like, can you do it in a way that feels authentic and true to the words, which is more important to me, which is to say that you can take these words and put them to melodies that don't fit even if they're catchy, even if they're fun, but if you actually translated the words, you're like, why on earth did they do this, right? And I wanted to make sure that it really actually fit in all possible ways, right? So I mentioned the Irish folk music, right? So sometimes the style of song that's chosen is on purpose. So why does the Lote Voshi sound sort of like a country song? It's got a mix of country and electronic dance music. Uh, those two things don't always go together, but they're both very danceable. Um, and Lote Voshi is the fast melody that people usually sing to Lechad Odi. In many synagogues, they start singing Lechad Odi slow, and then at the verse Lote Voshi, they switch to something fast. Mm. And often, people will dance. Not always, but in some congregations. And so I wanted to give people something that evoked that experience. Um, and so those genres naturally lent themselves to it. Um, the Latter-day Saints. <laughs> Yeah, there are there are there there is a Mormon influence on this album. We're, that, we haven't even gotten to the most discordant. interesting. Yeah, you're. I have to um, say that is not predictable that you, you um, brought them into this. So, so give us a little bit of that history. So I mean, people who know my writing know that I cover minority religious communities and their experiences. So Jews are one of those, but also Muslims and also Mormons. I've written a lot about Mormons over the years, um, and I'm always very interested in the music that comes out of these communities. Um, and the wonderful thing about Spotify and all these places is it's much more accessible than it used to be. Um, and so I go through faith-based a cappella groups. A cappella music comes out of, it means uh, in chapel, right? Uh, it is originally a religious form of music, and there's a lot of really good religious a cappella groups, and there's this Mormon group called Eclipse. Um, and they, Eclipse, I want to make sure people heard that. Eclipse. Okay. And uh, they um, have a whole bunch of albums. Some of them are more contemporary or covers of pop hits, and some of them are more faith-based music and hymns. And they have a hymn called Evening Prayer that they wrote themselves, both the melody and the words. Um, and it's a beautiful song, and you guys can find it uh, on all these, these services. Um, and it's a cappella, it has no music to it. Um, it's all just harmonies. And I heard it, and I felt, this is actually exactly what I'm trying to do um, on the album, but for uh, the Shabbat prayer of Vishamra, because uh, on Friday night in many synagogues, um, there's this prayer that comes from the Bible. It's really just a bunch of uh, biblical verses about the Shabbat that is recited on Friday night, and it's sung. Um, and so it is, in effect, the Jewish evening prayer. Um, and so it thematically fit, right? It tonally fit. And when I tried to put the words to the melody, it also just lyrically fit. Mm. fit. So I wrote to the, uh, the group and I said, can I use uh, your melody? Can I borrow it? Um, and they said, no problem. And so then we took it. And then, of course, this album is a musical album, so it's not a cappella. So although that track has a very strong choral feel and is meant to evoke the way you'd sing it in synagogue, which is the whole congregation singing it, it does have some uh, instrumentation. It has a violin. And so it's doing something. It, it takes their melody and then does something different with it. And so hopefully we added something uh, to their and wonderful original. And were they pleased with it? They did like it. Um, and I think that that's an example of the way that different types of music and different types of communities can talk to each other through music in a way they might not be able to talk to each other otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what, you know, sort of what, I, what inspired me in part about this album. Uh, I write for Jews, right? And Jews can't agree with each other on a million different things. There are many groups of Jews that don't talk to other groups of Jews and don't understand each other. And I try my best to explain them to each other, but you know, there are many people I'm never gonna reach. Uh, and there are many arguments that I'll make that some people will not listen to no matter what I say. Um, and the thing about music is that you can reach across many different kinds of divides 
uh, that words can't. Um, and so especially Shabbat music, where there are lots of different Jewish communities that don't realize that they sing the same songs and use the same melodies, um, because this is something that's a bit more universal um, than any other type of communication. Um, and so this is my way to sort of, and these, these melodies, I happen to be, you know, I, as I said, my, my father is a synagogue rabbi, he has a modern Orthodox synagogue in Queens, um, but these melodies I've heard from people who are Jewish, who are not, right, Jewish from all different backgrounds, different types of synagogues, we've already started to try to introduce these and found them meaningful, and uh, that is what I was hoping would happen. You know, Yair, I don't think of you, I mean, you're talking about bridging difference with music, and it's a beautiful idea, and I agree with you, but I kind of see you more of as a realist just in your life, that you're not always that person who's so hopeful in your writing. Um, I think that one of your gifts is just how blunt you are. But, you're, I mean, you're turning things. You're not necessarily exactly uh, telling the story that we're used to hearing. But is this a part of you that kind of is a little bit more kind of optimistic? Well, I think people th might think that I'm pessimistic because I write about negative things, right? So if you spend too much time writing about anti-Semitism and, I don't know, Israel-Palestine and a few other things, right? It does, you could get a little you know, despondent. Sometimes you need to take a break and write about, you know, uh, lighter subjects like uh, U.S. politics. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, it can give the impression, but of course, what, how could you possibly keep doing that without, you know, becoming depressed and burning out? A lot. So you see one of the secrets here, which is that I do projects like this album. And right. what I and need... They re-energize. Uh, exactly. When I need something that is energizing, that, give, that reminds me of what what it is, when you're writing about anti-Semitism and trying to explain to the world what it is and trying to do your tiny, tiny little part to reduce it, what is it that you're protecting? What is the positive Jewish content that mm. is the whole purpose of saying anti-Semitism? It's a bad thing, right? Because you'd much rather be spending your time on these positive Jewish things, whether it's talking about Harry Potter's translation to Yiddish, right? Whether it is, uh, you know, uh, a Jewish music album that can be shared across communities, right? These are all the things that, uh, frankly, I'd rather be writing about every day. Um, and so, that's, that's really the secret. That's you, the stuff that I do. You talk about the fact that Jewish music has evolved and that, in a way, part of our tradition is the new. You, your quote, one of the ways that Judaism has survived is the renewal of tradition. You can't survive by doing the exact same thing all the time because the world changes around you and people change. Sometimes I see um, we both move in Jewish circles where there can be a lot of resistance to change. Yeah. So how do you, with an album like this, kind of want to nudge people a little bit out of their comfort zones? Well, I mean, there's this line that uh, is in uh, the, the tefillah that people may know, uh, which is, Chadesh Aminu Kekedem, it comes at the end of the Eitz Chaim part of the prayer. And Chadesh Aminu Kekedem means renew our days like the days of old. How do you renew something that's like so that it's like it was old, right? So there's this internal inherent paradox that Judaism has always understood, which is you have these things that you carry with you uh, through time, uh, but the way they survive is that you uh, find new ways to express them, um, and you find ways to apply them and give them life uh, in new circumstances. Um, and things are not, in fact, always exactly the same, but they have this certain core. Um, and there is a certain element of recognizability, as well as the uh, reinterpretation and the revivification of that. Um, and so to me, that I think is what, what you know, good Jewish culture should do. Um, I think it's also what, um, and this is harder, right, what, uh, what good Jewish political imagination should mm. do. Um, and we're not so good at that part. Um, we're not so good at any of this stuff, uh, but we do it enough that we're still here. Right. Um, and so you know, it gives me hope that we can do it again. So let's uh, listen to one more song. Wh which one do you think was, is great that you'd like us all to hear that's going to sort of live It's like, which is your KBS? favorite song? It's like, which is your favorite child? Child, I know. Um, and it's unfair. So no, but I would say uh, if people want to get a feel for what the album sounds like and the core of it, uh, the first song on the album is uh, Yedid Nefesh, which is a song that many people sing when they're welcoming Shabbat. Um, and the way it's built is that you first hear me, and then you hear me singing with each of the two singers who do all the harmonies on the album, who are incredibly talented, unlike me, they read music, they play multiple instruments. Um, names are Arun Viswanath and Abala Savid. And I asked them to do me a favor, show up to the studio, right, and record some harmonies. Um, and then they just kept coming until everything was perfect, which is not what I expected. Um, and so when you listen to the song, you hear me, then you hear me and Arun, right, then you hear me and Abala, and then you hear all of us together. And nice. to me, that's sort of the, what we're trying to project for everybody else. Right. That you should be able to hear yourself singing and that you should be able to sing along and hear the harmonies together. Great. Let's hear that. Yedir nefesh avarachaman meshoch avdecha 
So you mentioned that you're not writing the music and you don't play any instruments. How are you actually composing? Yeah, so this is something we haven't mentioned yet, but the real secret sauce to this entire album is the producer, right? And this is true of almost any music project, basically, which is that uh, a huge amount of what you hear is not the name on the cover, but it's the person who produced the music. Uh, the producer of this album is a fellow named Charles Newman, um, who's been working in the music industry for decades, uh, but had never done, to best of my knowledge, a full Jewish music album of his own. He'd done some Jewish music. He himself is Jewish, and this stuff is meaningful to him, but this is not something he'd ever been asked to do. Um, and so we were connected, uh, was, I was looking for somebody who would appreciate the Jewish element of what I was doing, but not make it sound like all other Jewish music. And so that is exactly the sweet spot I wanted. And we met, we hit it off, we started doing some songs together. And once we felt confident in it, then we were ready to do the album. And so what you hear on this, uh, on the album, is me uh, recording a melody into my phone. Right? Sometimes you're recording and saying, here's the melody with the words, and then here's something I want the violin to do, right? or something like that, like to get that level. Um, but often I just do a melody, and then I give it to Charles, and then he writes the notes, and then he, having worked in the industry for a very long time, knows exactly which musicians he thinks would be perfect to do this. Right? And we get those people to play. Right? And I might say to him, I want to hear guitars here, or I want a violin here. Uh, and sometimes he'll say, great. And sometimes he'll come back to me and say, I heard something different. What are you about this? Mm. Right? And so it's this really wonderful collaborative project. And like some tracks are like what I had in my head when we started. Um, most of the tracks are like a combination of things that I had in my head and things that he came up with. Um, and then there's uh, some tracks where I came with something and he said, I have a totally different idea, and he convinced me. Um, so you say, uh, you'll yeah. find stuff on this album that I composed in a concentration camp, and you'll find stuff that I composed in a supermarket in Hungary, and you'll find stuff that I composed in Seattle's Pike Place Market. So you're just, these musical kind of threads are coming to you all the time? Yeah, and uh, thank goodness for smartphones, uh, because otherwise uh, a lot of these melodies would be lost. Uh, I just have to try not to look too weird when I like, you know, I'm in the supermarket and I have to hide in a corner and record it, so I'm not creeping anybody out. Uh, but you never really know when something will occur to you. Sometimes it's because of the resonance of the place, the emotional experience. Sometimes things just occur. I mean, a concentration camp. We don't Pretty obvious why certain things uh, would evoke certain emotions. Um, and so. Yeah, I don't like have a process. Because I don't play an instrument, I can't just sit down at a piano and start playing things out. Um, I'm usually just doing it in my head. Um, and then, you know, I work with Charles, we turn into music, we figure out what is the key, right? What is the tempo, right? What is the, the musical style that we want here? And then after we've done that and we've built the instrumentation around it at, with the musicians, then you bring in the harmony singers and you build all the harmonies around it. And then you redo how much of everything is in the track based on what you think is the best version. Um, and that takes a lot. And it took a long time to find Charles. I did multiple versions of some of these songs that you don't hear on this album. You don't hear the first three versions of Yedid Nefesh um, because it wasn't there yet. Um, and so it takes a lot of time to find the exact right collaborators and team. But when you do, uh, it makes you sound a lot better than you actually are, uh, which is true in so many things in life. Right, right. Well, congratulations, Yair, on this album. And I hope that it is in everyone's home, whether someone is, like, I guess, a, a young person dancing around or if it was hopefully in synagogues as well. The album is called Az Yashir, Now We Sing, by Yair Rosenberg and his incredible team. I'm Abigail Pogrubin. Thank you for joining us on In the Spotlight, and I look forward to seeing you next time.